Thanks for being here today to uh, join us for the first of four of our um, Invasive tr Tree and Forest Pest webinar series in 2020. Um, we are joined today by uh, this great group of people uh, from UC a and r and um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Hoddle. Uh, Dr. Hoddle is an extension specialist in biological control as well as the director of the Center of in for Invasive Species Research at oh. the University of California, Riverside. Anyway, uh, so thank you, Mark, for being here as the director of the Center of in space Invasive Species Research. We value your time. We know it's a seven day a week job and um, you've been working on palm weevil since the beginning for feels like forever now coming up on uh, six years so thank you yep. for um, being here to present to us today um, I'd like to take a second to thank the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection for funding this webinar series um, I also like to thank the uh, cooperative Ex the University of California Cooperative Extension Office uh, we are a group that provides research from the university and educational opportunities to a wide public audience to help solve local issues such as um, invasive tree pests so if you are here to um, listen and learn thank you if you are here to um, apply for continuing education continuing education units after this webinar. At the very end at 4.15, uh, we'll provide you a link. Um, that link will be to an anonymous feedback survey. We encourage all of you to please, please complete the feedback survey. Um, if you are going on to apply for CEUs, after completing the feedback survey, you will be provided a link to the CEU application you fill in your, uh, your name and your license number, click submit. That'll walk you through a 15 question quiz. Uh, you must pass the quiz with 70% to uh, be qualified for CEUs. And um, there's no time limit and you can take it as many times as you would like. So um, thank you for being here. Please bear with our technical difficulties. Hopefully that'll be the end of that. Um, and without further ado, thank you, Mark. Uh, take it away. You can share your right. screen. And uh, if anyone has any questions while we go through Mark's presentation, please put them in the chat box and I'll be collecting them. Randall and I will be collecting them and uh, we'll answer them at the end. Okay? All right. Thank, thank you, you, Leah. Okay, right. Now, hopefully, I'm not going to screw it all up and freeze everything by doing this. So let's see how we go. Okay, is that good on your end, Leah? Can you see this? Uh, I'm seeing your presenter view. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just see. Sorry, I must have had it right to start with, and now I have flipped it around. How's that? Still presenter view. Okay, that should be right now. You see my laser pointer? Okay, um, I'm looking at my full screen display, so I think I've got it right now. Okay, so um, I was asked to provide you updates on the invasion into Southern California, particularly San Diego County by this big palm weevil, the South American palm weevil, to bring you up to speed on some of the latest developments of the work that we've been doing. And uh, most of this work will be focusing in the Chula Vista Bonita area of uh, southern, southern San Diego County. So these are the things we're going to talk about. I'm going to provide an overview of weevil damage to the palms, uh, give you an idea of what to be looking for if you're out and about and want to know whether or not Canary Island date palms especially are infested with this weevil. We'll discuss some aspects of the weevil's biology as well. 
So I'll also go over what happened way back in 2010 when we first picked up this weevil in Tijuana and how it subsequently spread out of Tijuana into San Isidro and now it's made its way up to San Marcos in, in uh, San Diego County. So some of the work we've been doing has focused on weevil infestations in the Sweetwater Reserve, which is a riparian area in Benita, and that's quite close to Chula Vista. We have some trapping studies going there. We have been using drones to fly over the reserve to count the number of palm trees that are dying in the reserve. And my wife, Christina, and I, every six months, we drive around the reserve and we survey over 500 palm trees in people's gardens to see what the mortality rates are around that reserve. So what we're trying to do here is get an idea of what the weevil is doing in the reserve, how many palm trees it's killing in the reserve, and we do that with the drone. And then obviously the weevils aren't going to stay in the Sweetwater Reserve, they're spilling out into the urban areas and we're surveying palm mortality rates around the reserve. And I'll share all those data with you later in this presentation. We'll talk about some of the management work that we've been doing. We currently have um, insecticide studies going on with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific. And we've just wrapped up a big trapping study looking at two different types of traps that are used for palm weevil trapping. And we've also looked at different bait types to put into those traps to enhance the uh, attractiveness of the aggregation pheromone that goes into those traps. And I'll discuss those results with you as well. Mark? Mark? Yep. Yes. I, I hate to um, interrupt you, but we are all seeing your presenter view and on the first slide still. Oh, well, that's really weird. Um, everything is advancing for me. So... It says Sheen's screen sharing is paused for me. Why would that be happening? Is somebody controlling my screen? Uh, no, you are, should be all you. Are you using two screens? Uh, yes. Maybe try um, flipping them one more time. Keep sharing the screen. Uh, <laughs> normally when I do this, it's set up this way on Zoom. Now you will probably be seeing yeah. What, now, what are you seeing now? Now I see what are we going to discuss? Oh, okay. Well, uh, that's weird. Okay. So right now, this is completely reversed to the way it normally is when I do these Zoom talks. Okay. That's, that's fine. As long as you can see it now. We're also still seeing it in presenter view, though. Uh, that's why well, we, I, can I, see, we can see the next slide. See, that's why I, I don't understand what's happening here because it should be on this. Okay, now my mouse is frozen. Yeah. Right, my mouse doesn't work on Zoom anymore. It stopped. It was working, now it's just frozen. So we're seeing the cursor move around. Yeah, I can't move it on my screen. Oh, I can't, <laughs> I can't, that keeps freezing. I can't move it. <sighs> this is annoying. It's annoying for everybody. It's annoying, God. No, there, a, a comment out there is if you can, just keep going and, and uh, maybe we don't worry about it. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm getting two, if I swap my screens again, Who's seeing what now? Are you still seeing presenter view or are you seeing slide view? I only have two ways to, to show this, so. And it's still saying screen sharing is paused. I, I don't know how to turn that off. I still see your part, your presenter view, Mark, but um, you know, this might just be the way we can all see it, so. But um, you can't see me advance the slides, right? Uh, we can. Oh, you can now? In in your presenter view, we can see you advance the slides. Oh, wait. Oh, you got it. That's it. Whatever you did, that worked. Do that. <laughs> so I didn't do anything. <laughs> well, then we'll thank our stars and very sorry for the interruption. <laughs> That's okay. So are you seeing the full screen now? Yes. Like presenter view? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's keep going. Whoever flipped the button, thank you. Okay, so do you see dead palm trees now? Yes. Okay, and do you see a laser pointer moving around? Yes. Okay, good, <laughs> thank God. 
Yeah, all right. Okay, all right, let's get going. Okay, so back in 2010, I got a call to go down to Tijuana, and this is what we found. Dead Canary Island date palms all over Tijuana. Uh, we climbed up into those palms and had a look, um, and we pulled out these big black weevils, which were subsequently identified as the South American palm weevil, Rhynchophorus palmarum. While I was in Tijuana doing this, we were also dealing with another palm weevil invasion that had come into Laguna Beach. That weevil was Rhynchophorus vulneratus. We managed to eradicate that palm weevil from Laguna. We subsequently real, uh, figured out that that weevil had somehow got into Laguna Beach in Orange County and the um, founding population of that invasion was from Indonesia, an island in Indonesia called Bali. And to this day, we have no idea how those Indonesian weevils established themselves in Laguna Beach in Orange County, but we managed to eradicate them. While we were running that eradication program against Rhynchophorus vulneratus in uh, Laguna Beach, this other weevil was sneaking into Southern California and there just weren't enough funds to fight two palm weevil invasions at the same time. So that's why we have, um, I guess, these large populations of South American palm weevil now because nothing was really done to try and stop the spread when the initial occursion occurred. So this is now California's largest weevil and is about an inch and a half long, big insects. So a lot of the damage that you're going to be seeing in these areas that have heavy palm weevil infestations will be ultimately the death of the palm tree that you see here, the crown falls out and you basically end up with a halo of green fronds around the top part of the trunk. If you look at the fronds that have dropped onto the ground, you'll notice a lot of tunneling and the larvae that were feeding in the apical meristem of the palm here when they get ready to pupate, they come up into the fronds here, they make these pupation chambers, then they gather up these palm fibers and spin them into cocoons and they pupate within those cocoons just like a butterfly would pupate within a chrysalis or a cocoon as well. This uh, material here is the basal sheath. It sits at the bottom of the frond and as those weevil larvae are moving their way in and out of the palm crown, the apical meristem that they're feeding on, they basically turn those sheaths into Swiss cheese. And it, this is again, another very characteristic symptom. So if you see this material lying on the ground underneath a palm tree and it's riddled with holes, it's almost certain that you have palm weevil in that palm. Or if you see fronds that have dropped off the palm tree and they have these tunnels and pupil cocoons in it, uh, those are, that's also good evidence that you have a palm weevil infestation. And the way these weevils kill the palm is that they are feeding in the top part, the crown or the apical meristem, and the growing part of the palm tree is up here in the top part. You can see in this Canary Island palm here in the background, and I'm circling right now, that's where all the meat is, the palm heart, and that's where the weevils feed. They do a lot of damage to that area, and it basically prevents new frond growth coming up out of the top of the palm tree, and that ultimately leads to the death of the palm. So if you were to look inside these palms that are infested, you'll find all this rancid mash. Basically the palm weevils have chewed up the um, heart area of the palm tree. This is quite warm. There's a lot of fermentation activity going on in here. It has a very distinctive odor. And you'll see a lot of larvae in there feeding. If you take the very top part of the trunk off, you'll see that the weevils have basically hollowed it out, but they won't bore their way all the way down through the trunk. Basically, they excavate a basin underneath the apical meristem. What they really want to feed on is that palm heart, not the hard palm wood that makes up the trunk that sits underneath the uh, palm heart in the top of the Canary Island date palm. Removing these palms is quite expensive and it's difficult work. Uh, it's probably best to get an arborist in to do this. Uh, this one that we're removing here, the palm has died, the crown has dropped off it. Uh, the arborists removed all the fronds. They didn't have a chipper with them this day. We recommend chipping those fronds. So if there are any larvae or pupae in the bases of these fronds, they basically get sliced up when they go through the chipper. And then we recommend that this stuff is wrapped up so that any material, especially these whole fronds and the trunk that's removed, which could still have live adults and larvae in the top of it here, is wrapped up, taken off to a landfill, and then um, hopefully buried within a 24-hour period. So sanitation is quite important here. We don't want to be chopping these palm trees down, moving them somewhere and just leaving the trunks and fronds lying around in areas where the weevil may not currently be present. And this acts as an infestation source for starting new, new problems through um, 
I guess, inappropriate movement and relocation of these uh, infested materials. So the other issue that a lot of people have had is these palms have died and if they're not taking them down, this, these are photos from Imperial Beach when it's windy or if there's a lot of rain, the dead fronds fall out of these tree, uh, out of these palms. They stack up against the fences. They can fall onto the roofs of cars that are parked on the side of the street. And as many of you know, the bases of these fronds have very long, sharp spines, which can easily go through your shoes. You know, I've had them go through my work boots when I'm out working on these palms and puncture the bottom of my foot. So that's another significant hazard, which really, you know, suggests that these things should be removed if possible, but they're, but they're expensive. You're probably looking at about a, you know, better part of a thousand dollars to take down these types of palms that are easily accessible from the front road. But if they were behind some of these buildings and you needed equipment to get in there to lift them up over the roof or to avoid damaging fences, for example, you could be paying quite a significant amount of money to have those palms taken out safely and disposed of. So the life cycle is pretty simple. Uh, there are male and female weevils in the population. The sex ratio is about 50-50, half males, half females. These are long-nosed weevils and they, the females use the snout to drill a hole into the palm tree up in the top part of the palm. And once she's made that hole, she lays these rather large eggs into that hole. And then she'll cover those holes that she's laid her eggs into with a mucus type substance. It's kind of a plug that she puts over the top of it, probably to stop the eggs drying out or maybe even predators finding them and eating them. Those eggs hatch, you end up with these large grubs and it's the feeding by these larvae or grubs in the apical meristem or the palm heart that ultimately leads to the mortality of that palm. Once that palm heart is uh, irreparably damaged, the palm can't recover from that and it's unable to grow fronds and it subsequently dies. Once these larvae are ready to pupate, they move out of that apical meristem area where they have been uh, feeding. They bore those tunnels into the bases of the fronds. They gather up palm fibers and they spin these rather tight cocoons. And these are, are very impressive. You know, they're about the size of a small cigar. They're quite hard to crack open with your fingers. Um, so I've done, I've cracked one open here. You can see this is a pre-pupil larva. This is the last larval stage. It's finished spinning up its cocoon and I just pulled it out a little bit so you could see it. So this larva would molt or shed its skin one more time within this cocoon and then it develops these wing pads. And this is the pupil stage. It's still in the cocoon. I just pulled it out of the cocoon so you could see it, but it's gone from this pre-pupil stage, it's molted its skin, developed the wing pads, it'll shed its skin or molt one more time, and then the metamorphosis will be complete and you'll have a beetle inside that cocoon. Then that beetle uses its mandibles on the tip of its snout here, their two little teeth, they kind of look like one of those um, little grabber things that you use to pick up trash on the side of the road. And uh, they will chew a hole in the end of that cocoon and push their way out. So the adult weevils themselves are easy to sex. Males have these bristles or seti that sit on the top of the nose. You can see them here, top of the rostrum. Females lack these seti or bristles and their snouts are smooth. So we have a male here and this one is also a male. If that snout was smooth with no bristles on it, we'd be uh, looking at a female weevil. So quite easy to sex in the field if you catch them in traps. So we have the weevil present in California but in its native range, parts of Mexico, Central and South America, and the Caribbean, not only is it um, notorious for killing palms through its feeding, but this weevil vectors a plant pathogenic nematode, which is known as red ring nematode. And the adult weevils spread this nematode from palm to palm. They, uh, the, the, the nematodes that you can see down here can attach to the weevil body either phoretically, they might hang on to the outside of the body, or when the weevils inside the palm tree feeding or laying eggs or defecating, it can release these nematodes that may be contained within the body cavities of the weevil. So the mortality statistics for red ring disease in Costa Rica, for example, are quite impressive. Some estimates suggest that about 35 to 80% of palms can be killed once these weevils get in and start vectoring this nematode around. And within about six to 20 weeks post-infection, these palms die. There's apparently no cure for this infection. So if you manage to kill the, ne the weevils in your palm tree using insecticides, but those weevils have already inoculated those trees with, with nematodes, those palms are still going to die. 
So thankfully for us um, in California, even though we have a lot of palm weevils, there's no evidence that those weevils have accidentally introduced red ring nematode into Southern California. However, like a lot of these uh, plant pathogen vectors that we deal with in California, often you see the vector arrive first, then many years later, you see the disease causing organisms show up. So a good example of this is Asian citrus psyllid. We had the psyllid present in California for a few years. And then after that initial discovery of Asian citrus psyllid, we started to find trees that were dying from a disease called Huang Long Bing. And that's caused by a bacterium that Asian citrus psyllid vectors from, palm tr uh, from citrus tree to citrus tree. So we may see something similar with South American palm weevil. The disease may show up you know, several years from now. So the um, host range for South American palm weevil appears to be quite broad. It's a specialist on palms, but it definitely seems to prefer some palm species over others. In the home range, it's a well-known pest of coconuts. Here, in, and especially in Costa Rica, for example, it's a significant pest of African oil palms, which is obviously not native to uh, Central and South America, but it really likes feeding on those. In Southern California here, we have noticed that the palm that it really prefers to attack is the Canary Island date palm, Phoenix canariensis. There is uh, evidence in the literature that these weevils can also kill date palms, Phoenix dactylifera. So this weevil potentially poses a significant risk to the date gardens out in the Coachella Valley. And the first record of this, palm, uh, of this weevil in the Baja Peninsula, way down near Cabo San Lucas, it was recorded from um, Mexican fan palms, Washingtonia robusta. It was down there killing those um, fan palms in a natural reserve area. And that was the first record of South American palm weevil in the Baja Peninsula. I'm gonna show a slide of that in just a minute. So we also have one other record of a different palm species being killed by South American palm weevil in Southern California. And this is the Guadalupe palm, Brahea edulis. Um, these photos were taken by Greg Johansson with San Diego Parks and Rec at Balboa Park. And this is uh, these palms, I think there's about three of them that were killed. You can see the crown collapsing here. So Greg and his crew got up into these palms. They extracted larvae and adults. They were conclusively identified as South American palm weevil. And this is the first record of this palm actually being attacked. And this is the second palm species that we have definitively identified as being susceptible to attack by South American palm weevil in California. At this time, we have no records of date palms uh, Phoenix dactylifera, the edible date palm, being attacked and killed by South American palm weevil. So one question I get asked a lot is, well, you know, these are big weevils and they're spreading through Southern California. They're obviously flying around, you know, what, what, can you tell us how far, how far they can fly? And we can, and we've done these experiments in the laboratory where we set them up on these insect merry-go-rounds, they're called a flight mill. Each revolution is about one meter or three feet. And you can see a cable here that feeds data back to the laptop computer. And this glass disc has been read by a laser beam. This whole rotor is pivoting on a Rolex Ruby, so it's pretty much frictionless. So we set these weevils up for a 24 hour period. We let them fly. We look at how far males and females fly, if they're young weevils or old weevils, if they're fed or starved, if they're mated or not mated. So we've been able to do quite a few experiments to figure out what sort of um, parameters affect weevil flight. And the data are very interesting. Um, within a 24 hour period, we have estimated based on these artificial flight studies that we've done in the lab, that this weevil has a propensity to fly a long way. On average, they can fly about 24, uh, 28 miles in, in a single day. And they can fly for about four to five hours nonstop on that flight mill if they chose to do so. And during that time, they'll lose about 20% of their body weight. So those are quite impressive statistics. We even had one female that flew an amazing 93 miles in 24 hours, and she was still alive <laughs> at the end of this. Another female that flew 75 miles, and our longest flying male flew about 62 miles. 
So these studies in the lab are obviously highly artificial. Uh, obviously, weevils don't fly around in circles. They have perfect temperature. There's no wind resistance. They're well fed when we put them on the flight mills. But I think what these data suggest is that these weevils, should they elect to do so, have the capacity to fly long distances, which could suggest if they find themselves coming up against desert areas or chaparral, and they're having a hard time finding food, they could probably fly across a 10 mile patch of land that has no palms as they go into maybe an adjacent urban area looking for something to attack. Another way these weevils could spread long distances is through the inadvertent movement of infested palm trees out of San Diego County on the back of these flatbed trucks. And right now, as I don't think this has changed, there are no quarantines to prevent the movement of live palms out of areas of San Diego County that are infested with South American palm weevils. So you could end up with palm trees going up to LA, maybe through to San Luis Obispo, wherever they end up, and you may accidentally introduce South American palm weevils into, into new areas through transportation of live palms on these trucks. So let's just backtrack a little bit. So the first record of South American palm weevil was down here in Todos Los Santos back in November of 2000. And they, the, the publication on this indicated that these weevils were in a natural areas preserve and they were killing Mexican fan palms, Washingtonia robusta. 10 years later, we found the first of the Canary Island date palms that had died up here in San, up here in, in Tijuana. So if you do some very simple mathematics, you know, there's the linear distance from uh, Todos Los Santos all the way up to Tijuana, it's about 1500 kilometers or 932 miles, which if you just divide it by the number of years it took them to go from the tip of the Baja way up to Tijuana, they're moving at about 93 miles per year, or about 150 Ks, or about eight miles a month. So that's assuming that these weevils just move naturally up the peninsula on their own and that there was no human, inadvertent human movement of infested palm trees all the way up to, to Tijuana. So I think based on the flight mill data that I just showed you that it's really possible that this weevil could have just hopscotched its way up the Baja Peninsula from town to town, city to city, feeding on uh, suitable species of palm trees. And it just took a 10 year period to slowly migrate all the way up to Tijuana and then just jump across the border into San Isidro. And, southern San Diego County. So this map shows you where the most northern record I currently have for South American palm wheels up here in San Marcos. And a lot of the work that we're doing down here in the Sweetwater Reserve in Bonita, it suggests that it's taken about, um, I don't know, four or five years, something like that, to move all the way up from the Sweetwater Reserve up to San Marcos. And again, if you take the linear distance there and just divide it by the number of years, it suggests it's moving at a rate of about six miles per year northwards. That's not very fast, given the high capability that this weevil has for flying long distances. And I think potentially one of the reasons why this movement of palm weevil through San Diego County has been slow is that it doesn't have to fly very far to find the next palm tree to feed on. One infested palm is often next to another infested palm and it may just be a few hundred yards to get to the next one from there. So I'm just gonna to put together several um, studies that we have done. So the first records of South American palm weevil were down here in Tijuana in 2010. Mark, yes. excuse me, this is Jan. I'm sorry to interrupt, but apparently your slides are not um, forwarding. We're still on the um, map of Mexico, first detection in okay. Baja. All right, um, they're forwarding just fine for are me you? Okay. at my end, so I don't know how to fix that. Um, I can try going backwards. Are they moving backwards? Do you see the map of Mexico now? No, it's just frozen on that. So again, this message has come up saying my, my screen is being, being paused. I, I'm not controlling that. I don't know why, how my screen is being paused. Can somebody fix that? It's, it's not under my control.
Uh, Mark, can you try to unshare your screen or reshare it? Perhaps I'll fix the problem. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Let me just try that again. Okay, can you guys see my screen now? It's, it. it's still the map of Mexico, but we can see your um, cursor moving. Okay, so let me advance. Oh, <laughs> great. Oh, there you go. Just, it? Did, did it move to the next map? Yes. Okay. All right, so this map is what I just explained about the movement out of um, these infested areas down in Bonita all the way up to San Marcos and it's our estimates is that the weevils moving at about a six mile per year movement northwards away from infestation zones and we think this is relatively slow because there's a lot of food for the weevil to feed on. Okay do you see the next map with the big grid laid over it? Yeah. Okay great okay. So we picked up the weevil for the first time in 2010 down here in Tijuana. There were just one or two palm trees. I went back in 2016. There were hundreds of dead palms in Tijuana. We followed a trail of these dead palms into southern San Diego County, and I followed those dead palms all the way up to here, the Sweetwater Reserve. And this is going to be the focus of the remainder of this presentation. We're doing the bulk of our work around this area of Benita and Chula Vista. So I'm highlighting or circling right now with, with my uh, laser pointer here, the Sweetwater Reserve, and we have 10 palm weevil traps in this reserve, and we clear them every month, and we count the number of weevils that are in those traps. And then in a north, south, west, and east direction around the palm, uh, around the reserve, we've tagged, using our GPS system, 519 palms that are growing in people's gardens and parks, maybe in shopping malls, that type of thing. And every six months, every February and every August, we drive around those 519 palms and we just assess whether or not they are alive or dead. So we're taking a mortality statistic of the survivorship rates or mortality rates of palms in the urban area. And in the Sweetwater Reserve, we fly the drone every three months and we're counting the number of palm trees that are dying in the reserve. Okay, did we advance to the next one? Yeah, I hope so. Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm guessing yes. So this is a bit of a close up. You can see the 10 traps here overlaid the Sweetwater Reserve and some of the 519 palms identified here in these with these green flags that we monitor every six months. So this is the Sweetwater Reserve where we are doing our work. It's a riparian area. Certain times of the year over winter, early spring, water flows through here and it just goes out to the Pacific Ocean. And as a result of this waterway, it's supported um, natural vegetation such as willows and oaks and hundreds and hundreds of Canary Island date palms have naturalized in this reserve. And those palms are acting as big incubators or food sources for the South American palm weevil, which is subsequently leaving the reserve here and flying into these urban areas and also here into the Glen Abbey Cemetery where they've lost a lot of Canary Island date palms as well. So here's a close up of that Google Earth map. You can see the Canary Island date palms here. They kind of look like sea anemones. They are towering over the native vegetation, which is mainly willow through here and a few oak trees. This brown palm that you see here is one that has been killed by the South American palm weevil. So in that reserve, we had these 10 traps. We used the bucket trap. And that bucket trap is uh, loaded up with fermenting bait. We use dates, and I'll get to some of the work that we did on that in just a few minutes. And you need the fermenting bait in the bucket. And we put it in this yogurt container. We put in some dry dates, add water to it, and we also add a packet of uh, baker's yeast to get the fermentation process going. So each one of these little pottles is essentially a, a brew. It's a date beer and it's probably what the pharaohs drank 3,000 years ago back in Egypt. And attached to the lid of the bucket trap, we have an ethyl acetate synergist and we also hang the commercially available aggregation pheromone and there's a company in Riverside that makes that and we just get our pheromones from those guys and it works really well. We have four holes drilled around the bucket for the weevils to get into and then they drop down into the antifreeze when they're attracted to the bait and the um, aggregation pheromone 
and you can see some of the weevils here that have drowned in the antifreeze. The buckets are hung in trees and the weevils basically fly to them, walk up the burlap, into the hole, drop into the bucket and they die. So every month I go out and I count the palm weevils and this graph shows you two things. The green bars show the total number of weevils that are counted each month. You can see back here in about April, March, April, May of um, 2018, our peak number of weevils that we caught in those 10 traps was about 330 weevils. So we got about 33 weevils per trap on average. After this big peak, the number of weevils that maxed out in our traps each spring and summer has slowly gone into decline. And this may be because they're killing so many palm trees in the Sweetwater Reserve, they just don't have as much food to feed on anymore. But you can see these very distinct peaks and troughs in these data. The weevil is most active late spring through mid late summer. Then once we move into fall and winter activity drops away quite a bit, but not totally. They're still active over winter and I'll show you another slide in just a minute. This orange line that you see here is the sex ratio of the numbers of weevils that we catch in the bucket traps. So what I'm showing here are the percentage of females that we catch. It bounces around a little bit, but it is remarkably consistent over time. We catch about 66% females and about 33% males. And this is probably because the aggregation pheromone is uh, male produced and it's probably more attractive to females than it is to males. But we still on average get about 33% males and about 66% females entering the traps. This blue line is the cumulative number of weevils that we have captured over time. And we've up to almost four and a half thousand weevils that we've caught over the four and a half years that we've been doing this study at the Sweetwater Reserve. Basically each one of these blue dots is a green bar from the previous graph added to the next one. So we just keep totaling up the number of weevils that we catch. You can see over our first winter 2016-2017 we were still catching weevils but not that many. This winter was cold and dry. Our next winter was warm and dry and there was really no slowdown in the number of weevils that we caught. Our next winter was cold and wet. The weevils plateaued a little bit, slowed down but we were still catching them. And then winter of 2019, 2020 was quite cold again. Weevils plateaued a little bit, but we were still catching them coming to the traps. And then once winter passed, we went, we continued with this accelerating upward trajectory of the numbers of weevils that we were catching at the Sweetwater Reserve. So we now have a very nice data set on the numbers of weevils that we catch each month at the reserve. And what we've been flying the drone over the reserve every three months and photographing this, we wanna see if there's a relationship between the numbers of weevils that we catch and the numbers of dead palm trees that we are seeing in the reserve. So the drone is pr programmed to fly the same route every time it goes out, it flies at the same height, it stops at the same spot and it takes these high resolution photographs. And we're able to stitch these photographs together to make a big uh, photo map of the reserve. And you can see it's quite easy to tell healthy palm trees from palm trees that have been killed by the South American palm weevil. Stitch a few of those together and you can see we've got a number of healthy palms in here, some that are dying, some that have been completely killed by the weevil. So we've numbered all these palms and every few months when we fly the, the drone we just tally up the number of new palms that have been killed by the South American palm weevil. So here are the data. When we first started our first drone flight, there was a standing mortality of around 6%. So the weevil had been in there, had killed about 6% of the weevils before we started this experiment. And as we've flown the drone through time, you can see that the number of palms is just that have died through weevil attack has steadily increased. And we're now up to about 42, 43% of the palm trees in the Sweetwater Reserve have been killed by South American palm weevil. We're following about 761 palm trees in the reserve. Oh, I've got the number there wrong. So in the urban areas, we have over 500 palm trees that we are following in those north, east, south, and west directions. Every six months we drive around. And when we set this experiment up in August of 2016, none of those palms that we tagged with the GPS in these urban areas had died. They all look completely healthy to us. And similar to what you saw in the previous slide, using the drone to monitor palm mortality at the Sweetwater Reserve. Palm mortality has just steadily increased in these urban areas and we're up to about 47% now of those urban palms have been killed by the South American palm weevil over a four year period. 
So how can you protect these palm trees from attack? Right now, the best tool that we have are insecticides, especially systemic insecticides that travel in up the inside of the palm. These can be applied as soil injections, trunk injections, or drenches to the soil. Uh, Don Hodel, a palm, a UCC, a UC Cooperative Extension Palm expert, doesn't like the idea of damaging the palm trunk because those wounds don't close over and heal, and they could be uh, sites for insect attack or pathogen infections. Another way that you can protect your palm tree is just by getting up into the crown and then drenching it with a, with a solution of insecticide that also has systemic activity. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So another thing that folks have used to contact insecticides, these are applied to the palm fronds. They leave a le lethal residue on the foliage. So when adult weevils are attracted to that palm, they walk over the residue and that kills them. And these types of insecticides will also kill other insects that may inadvertently or deliberately land on those palm fronds. But some of the arborists that are recommending these uh, treatments want to put on a contact insecticide to kill any adults that are coming to the palm. Then they have the systemic insecticides that they apply often as a drench to the soil or maybe as a type of soil injection, which then moves up to the palm tree, up through the palm trunk, accumulates in the meristematic area of the palm. And the idea is that those systemic insecticides protect those, um, that palm heart from weevil attack. One person that we've been working with very close to the Sweetwater Reserve has been drenching his own palm trees. He does that. He has his own bucket lift and he basically went down to Home Depot, bought one of these systemic insecticides, mixed it up in his bucket. And he just drenches the, the crown himself until the stuff runs out and down the trunk you know, between the fronds. So he's in a very high pressure area. Uh, he's come to the conclusion that he needs to treat his palms about every six months. Uh, he let one of his treatments slip to about 10 months and then he noticed that some of the uh, palms were starting to show weevil damage. So he's gone back to a strict six monthly cycle now and he's using a midocloprid to treat those palms through doing these crown drenches. We're doing these insecticide trials with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific. We have about eight products that we're testing with them. These trials started in 2018. We've had some promising preliminary results. We've now scaled up these trials to a much larger study that we're currently doing out at Balboa Park. And we're hoping that by the end of summer of next year, those experiments will be done and we'll have some definitive um, data to share with you on the types of insecticides and the rates and the frequency of applications that you'll need to make to palm trees if you want to protect them from South American palm weevil. But that, that work's still ongoing at this stage. But I can share some photographs with you um, that shows that palm recovery is possible. Back in August, back in uh, February of 20, um, 2018, this palm tree, we had classified it in an urban area as being dead. It was just a ring of green fronds at the top of this trunk and didn't think anything of it. We marked it as dead and drove off. Came back six months later in August 2018, couldn't believe it, the fronds were still green. And there was this tiny little sprig of palm starting to, new fronds starting to come up out of the center of that palm tree. So I asked the homeowner in the back, you know, what, what, what happened here, what did you do? And he had an arborist come in, treat that palm tree, and they must have just treated it at like the, the 11th hour. There must have just been a little bit of meristematic tissue that hadn't been killed by the palm weevil that was still alive in the top of that trunk, and it began to sprout back. And here's a close-up of that uh, sprouting carrot top back in of August 2018. And we've photographed it every six months since then. You can see now the fronds are starting to recover, looking pretty good. February 2019, August 2019, those fronds have really come back quite strong now. And then February 2020 and August 2020, you wouldn't know that that palm had suffered quite a, a heavy palm weevil attack and it looks pretty good now. So in this last time that we were out of August 2020, we were in the Bonita area and this palm tree that we'd been monitoring, we'd classified it as dead and we drove past it again. And I noticed that it had a little sprig of growth coming out of the top of it. And when I was photographing that, the homeowners came running over to me wanting to know why I was photographing their palm tree. And I told them they had this sprig of growth and, it looked, and I asked them if they had, excuse me, had treated their palm tree and they said that they hadn't. They had done no insecticide treatments on this palm. 
which suggests that the palm weevils had not completely killed all of the meristematic tissue in the top of this tree and there's a little bit left and it's starting to sprout and come back again. So we're going to follow up and look at that again in February of 20, uh, 2021 and see how well that recovery is going on. So we may have another photograph to share with you if that palm tree is still alive next year. So getting on to trapping, uh, what are the best traps and baits to use for monitoring or trying to mass trap South American palm weevil? We've tested two traps. This bucket trap that we're using at the Sweetwater Reserve is a, is a pretty standard trap that's used in a lot of uh, palm weevil trapping programs around the world. It's also used for red palm weevil management in the Middle East, and that's an invasive pest there killing date palms. And there's another palm trap, uh, palm weevil trap that's commercially available that sits on the ground. It doesn't hang in the trees like the bucket trap. And this is the Pacusan trap, and it's a funnel shaped trap which goes on the ground. The weevils are attracted to it. They walk up the sides. There's one hole for them to go in. They drop in, and it's shaped like a funnel. Once they fall down into the collection reservoir in the bottom of this um, funnel, they can't get out again. And that's an issue with the bucket trap. Um, and I'll show you some data in a minute. Weevils can arrive at the bucket trap. They can walk in and out of the holes. And if they don't get trapped in there, quite a few of them will leave and they won't come back. And we figured that out by uh, video, building some micro video cameras with infrared um, camera lenses so we could photograph these things 24 seven. And we did this for about better part of eight months and we had about, I think it was 42,000 hours of videotape to figure out why was the bucket trap an inferior trap to these cone-shaped Bakusan traps that sit on the ground? And the answer was quite simple. Weevils go in and out of these holes, you catch about 30% of them, maybe takes 20 or 30 minutes before the weevils decide to stay or leave. The videoing of these traps show that it takes about three minutes for the weevil to walk up, drop in, and they catch and retain about 95% of the weevils that go in there. So the Pacusan trap is by far a superior trap for catching South American palm weevils compared to the bucket traps that I'm using at the Sweetwater Reserve. And these data show that quite clearly. Average number of weevils caught in a bucket traps less than one. Pacusan traps catch on average about six times more weevils under the same experimental conditions. So we've concluded that this is the superior trap to use. And if people are going to be starting monitoring or management programs, don't use the bucket trap, use the Pacusan trap instead. These again are commercially available. You can get them in Riverside from the same company. It's Iskatech. They also sell the aggregation pheromone. They asked us to trial this trap for them. I was quite skeptical when they gave it to us because everybody around the world uses the bucket trap. I'd already started using the bucket trap. Didn't want to be on my hands and knees doing this thing, but boy, it works super well. So I've had to change my, <laughs> change my opinion on that. The Kusin traps are better than the bucket trap. So re you may remember that um, I mentioned that you should, you have to, um, bait your traps. So you put the aggregation pheromone in, but you need this fermenting bait. And what makes the bait ferment is yeast. And we were interested in whether or not different types of yeasts may make the fermentation process more attractive to the weevils. So I'd started this work a long time ago just by putting bread yeast into the dates that we put in that pot with the water. And the only reason I used the bread yeast was because I could get it at the supermarket pretty easily. But after looking around on the internet, I discovered you could buy different types of yeast. There's a fruit wine yeast that we tested, and it's a different species of Saccharomyces. It's by anus, as compared to Cerevisiae. And then the other yeast that we used was this lager yeast, which is Pastor Pastorianus here. So we trialed those in the bucket traps and the Pacusan traps. And the data again, as you see here, are very clear. The first take home message is that Pacusan traps always catch, captured more and retained more weevils than the bucket traps shown here in magenta. And yes, the yeasts did have an important impact. And serendipitously, bread yeast that you buy at the supermarket, once it starts fermenting up with the dates, attracts and retains more weevils than either the uh, fruit wine yeast or the lager yeast. So if you want to invest a little bit more money to make your uh, trap maybe a little more efficacious, when you set up your dates as part of your fermenting bait, just add a packet of baker's yeast to it and it'll um, you know, boost your weevil captures a bit. So some of the caveats for using traps. Placement is really important. Don't hang traps near palm trees. 
You may attract the weevils to the traps, but if they don't go in the trap, especially if you're using the bucket trap, they may end up attacking the palm tree instead. As I mentioned, the work that we've done has indicated that traps are not 100% efficient at capturing weevils. Bucket traps appear to be about 30 to 40% efficient. Those percussion traps are about 90 to 95% efficient at, at, at retaining the weevils that go into them. So the bucket trap, 30% weevils, that's the big problem. Sun exposure, this is the other thing, work out of Europe where they're using these traps to um, control red palm weevil, which is an invasive pest there that also attacks Canary Island date palms. They put their traps out in the full sun and they put thermometers and that inside them and they conclusively showed that reasons why, probably one of the reasons why traps that are put in full sun or have high midday exposure to sun result in weevil, low weevil captures is because those temperatures inside the traps can reach about 140 degrees Celsius, which probably shuts down the pheromone and stops the fermentation process. So their recommendation, and we're taking it because we think it's correct as well, is that if you're putting your traps out, you should put them into partial or full shade. And that really just preserves the, eff uh, the, the efficacy of the, of the baits and the uh, aggregation pheromone that's in those bucket traps. So put your if you're going to use the, the traps, especially the percussion and the bucket traps, we recommend using percussions. Put them in partial or full shade so you're not reducing the pheromone and bait attractiveness. So take home messages for trapping. We're recommending that the uh, commercially available percussion trap is used. It's just much better at catching um, palm weevils in the bucket trap. So we ran these experiments a couple of times. We hang, hung the buckets and we also put the buckets on the ground because we thought, well, maybe it's a hanging versus ground thing. It made no difference. The bucket trap, whether it's hanging or sitting on the ground, doesn't catch as many weevils as the percussion trap, which always sits on the ground. Bait type, uh, the Pukasan trap, you can just put the lure only in there. No fermenting bait, it works pretty well. But if you have the lure and fermenting bait, especially the dates and baker's yeast, you can really boost the levels of, of weevil captures that, that you get. But again, it's going to cost you more money and it's going to be extra work replacing those baits every month. Trap placement, we're suggesting that you don't put your traps on palm trees. If you have um, palms of concern that you're worried about being attacked by the weevil and you want to put traps out to see whether or not there's weevil activity in the general area, you might want to put them a quarter to half a mile away from the palms that you're worried about. It doesn't really matter where you put the traps. You can put them on a fence, put them on down on the ground, put them in a pile of rocks. The weevils really don't care. If they smell that aggregation pheromone and fermenting bait, they will go to that trap. And we think, you know, if you get weevil captures within a quarter to half mile away from those palm trees that you're worried about, there's a pretty reasonable likelihood that weevils may be active closer to your palms and you might want to think about starting some sort of management program for those um, palms pretty quickly. And just the last thing to emphasize what I mentioned earlier about placing those traps in the shade to maintain the efficacy of the, of the lure and the fermenting bait. If they're sitting in the sun, everything gets cooked and it doesn't work very well. So after talking about putting the percussion traps <laughs> on the ground, one set of very innovative uh, pest control advisors managed to actually hang percussion traps way up here in the crown of the palm trees. You see them there? There's some spectacular engineering that they managed to do. And even more alarming, they put a trap on every palm tree. You see another one attached here. So we had to tell them that that probably wasn't such a good idea, take them down, move the traps away, if the weevils are smelling that pheromone and the pheromone's way up here in the sky and all the wind's blowing around, every tree has a pheromone lure in there, you know, the stuff could have been drifting for miles <laughs> and the weevils could have been smelling it a long way away. And we've been flying into this, into these traps, miss the traps and they end up in the crowns of these palm trees. So this is an example of what not to do. Will you get other weevils in the traps? Yes, occasionally, very rarely, very rarely you will get another black weevil. And we've had maybe only one or two captures of this other weevil and it's the agave snout weevil. It is smaller than the South American palm weevil and its rostrum or beak or nose is much thicker and more highly curved than the South American palm weevil. These 
agave snout weevils are attracted to the traps not because of the pheromone but because they smell the fermenting bait and they're probably just going in there to see if there's something good to eat just want to backtrack a little bit this photograph is of a female weevil and you can see that her rostrum here her snout lacks those bristle like seti it's very smooth and only the males have the bristles that sit on the top of the of the nose on top of the rostrum on top of the snout in the traps you will find somewhat frequently uh, weevils heavily infested with these mites now, these mites are not biological control agents they are saprophytes that feed on the rotting palm material and they are hitchhiking a ride from the south from palm tree to palm tree on these adult weevils and there are two species of these mites that were found this one that you see attached to the legs around the rostrum and then there's another species of mite that's only found underneath the elytra or these wing covers if you lift if you pull these wing covers open and look underneath them there the, the concave and the mites will be packed up in the underside of those wing covers or the elytra so that's how these mites move around we don't know if these mites are native to california they may have inadvertently moved into southern california with the south american palm weevil because they need them to move from palm tree to palm tree because they feed on the rotting palm material and we're working on that right now we hope to have them identified with a mighty expert out at the ohio state university Biological control is a possibility. We have a grant from the USDA to go to South America, Brazil, to look for this parasitic fly. Uh, this is a bit of a black box for us. Nobody has studied the biology, behavior, or ecology of this fly, so we don't know how easy it is to work with in the laboratory, whether you can rear it or get these adults to mate inside a box, inside a cage, inside the lab. But the work that has come out of Brazil suggests that this fly is quite an important biological control agent of South American palm weevil. Several, two studies done by the same lab, different areas, different times of, uh, of the year down in Brazil, suggest that parasitism ranges anywhere from 30 to 70%, but the year round average is around 50%. So these flies, we think, lay their eggs um, in rotting palms that have been attacked by the weevils. Those eggs hatch and the maggots track down a weevil larva. And then as that weevil larva is starting to pupate, the fly maggots move into that pupil chamber and they feed on either the pre-pupil larva or the um, pupa itself. And through that feeding, they kill it. And the work out of Brazil suggests that for every weevil that's parasitized, you get about 18 fly cocoons or 18 flies coming out of those cocoons. So that's pretty good. You get kill one weevil and you get 18 flies coming out of it. We don't know how safe this fly is, whether or not it'll attack other weevils or other insects in California. Uh, the money that we have from the USDA is just to go down to Brazil and just do some of the basic biology of the fly. Nobody knows how to mate this thing. And some of these tachinid flies or these parasitic flies, they have very fussy reproductive biology. And they may or may not mate inside a cage. And if they don't mate within cages inside the laboratory, there's basically no way we could work with them in a quarantine facility. So there's a few questions about the basic biology of this fly that we need to answer before we can potentially begin a biocontrol program targeting South American palm weevil with this parasitic fly. So we have a website up on the South American palm weevil. Um, you can go to that, get some of the basic information that I've been discussing today. And there's also a site within this um, website where you can uh, provide information on dead palm trees should you see them. So to track the spread of the palm weevil through Southern California and San Diego County, there's no formal surveys going on. We're basically relying on community scientists to provide us information on where they are finding um, South American palm weevil and where those palm trees are, are being killed. So you can get all that information from, from the website. Uh, you don't have to write any of this down. If you have your cell phones with you, you can just scan this quick read code and it'll take you to the website. And once you're at the website, if you have uh, any reports of dead palms in your area that you'd like to share with us, we would love to get those from you. Uh, you can also upload photographs, uh, the street address, GPS coordinates, uh, some of your contact details if you want to share those with us. And we're putting those into a big Google Earth database and we're plotting uh, the spread and kill spread of the weevil and the kill rate of the weevil by 
by basically asking volunteers to help us with some of these surveys. Hopefully you've all managed to scan that. So we've had funding from the USDA, from CDFA specialty crops, West Coast arborists have been really helpful. They've cut down a lot of palm trees for us to get weevils out of and the California Date Commission has sponsored some of this work as well. And I have a little quick little video I'd like to play for you guys. If I can turn this off. Oh, come on. There we go. And hopefully you'll see this video playing and you can all hear it. Ah, Southern California. You know, the whole surfs up, tinsel town, sun soaked glamour thing. Too bad this idyllic landscape is mostly make believe. Take the palm trees. They're not even real trees. They're more closely related to grass. And they're imported. Like this Canary Island date palm. It came halfway around the world to be one of the more dazzling stars in the landscape. But this Hollywood success story is turning into a horror movie. This little monster is the South American palm weevil. Scientists first found it in San Diego in 2011. Weevils are just beetles with snouts. This female uses hers as a drill to get at the palm's apical meristem. It's a bowl of juicy goodness at the top where the leaves sprout. She lays her eggs down in those tunnels and her spawn eat the palm from the inside out, starting with its heart. That's right, it's the same stuff you can get at a supermarket. They'll turn this palm's healthy flesh into a rotting mess that smells like a dumpster in the sun. Once they're big enough, the larvae will spin cigar-shaped cocoons from the leftover fibers they can't eat. As the trees frond, starve, and die, the larvae hang out and gestate, morphing into pupae and... Ew, that's just... Oh man, that's gross. As adults, they burst out, take flight, and seek out a new host leaving behind the dying hollow shell of a once majestic palm. Mark Hoddle at UC Riverside is tracking the weevil infestation. He puts them on a kind of aerial treadmill in his lab to test their stamina. He's trying to figure out how they got here, whether they hitched a ride on imported palms or made the trip themselves. Turns out they can fly up to 15 miles a day, enough to hopscotch from palm to palm on their own. The only way to stop them? Treat every palm tree in their path with pesticides before the weevils get there. That'll be tough to do. So these particular botanical icons could be on the fast track to being just another Hollywood has-been. These weevils are pretty gnarly. So we asked Anna Rothschild from Gross Science to do those animations for us. Thanks, Anna. You're welcome, it's my pleasure. I love gross stuff. So there is one other way to manage these larvae, sort of a biological control, which people do in some places like Thailand, Peru, and Ghana. Entomophagy. Eating bugs, mmm, tasty. So hop over to my channel for a whole episode about it. And thanks for watching this deep look. Okay, that's it. If you've got any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to try and answer those for you. So we've been uh, monitoring the chat. We've got uh, a couple of administrative questions. Um, we've got some statements about other trees that are impacted. 
and then a number of questions. Um, before I give you your first question, I'd ask anybody that is um, signed in with just a first name or um, something that doesn't give your complete name, can you just put in the chat box, um, if you haven't already done that, what uh, your full uh, name is, first and last name, so we can match that up against the uh, enrollment form. So the first question, uh, Dr. Hoddle, is how do you distinguish the cause of death from images, um, ground truthing? Oh, um, so that's respect with respect to the drone work at the Sweetwater Reserve. Yeah, we haven't ground truthed any of the um, palms in the Sweetwater that we have assigned uh, palm weevil mortality to. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, we don't have the manpower and trying to slug all the way through that water and that dense thicket, under thicket of willows and a lot of mustard weed and other stuff in there is, is very difficult to do. However, we feel pretty confident probably just about every palm tree in there that we have recorded as dying has probably died from South American palm weevil attack because that death signature is very characteristic. You know, the crown falling out and then just that brown star-shaped pattern of dead fronds on the top of the, of the crown. And there's so many of these palms in the Sweetwater Reserve now and, um, you know, it's hard to believe something else other than the South American palm weevil would have been responsibility for would have been responsible for the that those high levels of mortality that we are currently recording. The second question um, relates to the insecticide being used for treatment. Um, I think you've addressed that. I don't know if they're looking for more specificity on that. Yeah, so um, right now your best treatment options are to use these systemic insecticides and they belong to a couple of different groups. Uh, the most easy to get your hands on and efficacious that we have identified so far are these neonicotinoids. Imidacloprid is one that you can buy at you know, Home Depot or Lowe's and you just mix it up according to, according to the directions there. And then a trapping question, where can we buy the Picusson trap? Yeah. And can you spell the name of the vendor who sells it in Riverside? Yeah, so um, the Picusson traps are sold by Iskatec. That's I-S-C-A-T-E-C-H, Iskatec, and that's all one word. Those guys also sell the aggregation pheromone. They make it on site, so when you pick it up, it's basically batch brewed and it's super fresh and it's here in Southern California and it's easy to easy to get hold of. So we've just used them because they're local and convenient and uh, we haven't had to import this stuff from overseas. We just go down to them, pick up our orders and go and deploy them in the field. Excellent segue into the next question. What is aggregation pheromone and can it be used for many insects? Yeah, so aggregation pheromone is um, pr is produced by these palm weevils, and it's a male-produced pheromone. And a pheromone is a chemical that, in the, at least in this instance, it's a, it's a chemical that's released into the air that's attractive to both sexes of the same species. So even though um, females seem to respond more uh, strongly to the aggregation pheromone, at least when it comes to captures in these traps, males will also respond to it. And the idea is that the aggregation pheromone is released by males when they find a palm tree that they think suitable for feeding and they want to attract females there so they can mate and then they can begin breeding in that palm tree. So if you contrast the aggregation pheromone, which is attractive to both sexes, uh, a sex pheromone, for example, maybe something like the codling moth pheromone, is only attractive to one sex. And that's used primarily to attract the opposite sex for mating. So for example, if you have a female produced sex pheromone, it attracts the males of that species and they, males and females can find each other for mating. And again, it's often a volatile, uh, airborne volatile that males are that can track and vanishingly small amounts are needed and that um, they can be highly effective not only for monitoring but also for controlling pest populations. 
Okay, and then uh, we've got some, some new questions that have just come in. Um, any idea why the insect would skip certain palms in a heavily infested area? God, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, so the patterns of attack, <laughs> sometimes they just make no sense at all. And we really don't know what motivates the weevil to attack one palm tree, skip over two palm trees in a row, and maybe attack the fourth palm tree in a row of trees. Um, it's, a, it's, it's something that a lot of people have commented on in areas it's often quite obvious and confusing as to why they would have knocked out a bunch of palms but left some very close ones standing. We, we don't have a good answer for that. Um, another question, do the males of other weevil species that are attracted also have a bearded rostrum? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, with other species of Rhynchophorus, those are the pa pa big palm weevils that we're dealing with. So like Rhynchophorus ferrugineus, Rhynchophorus palmarum, which is the one we just talked about, the South American palm weevil, Rhynchophorus vulneratus, Rhynchophorus cruentatus, which is uh, native to Florida. All of those weevils have um, those bristles on the tops of their noses. Now, um, I'm working with another species of weevil right now, the avocado seed weevil, and males of that species do not have bristles on the top of the nose. So it tends to be a genus specific thing. So the genus Rhynchophorus has those bristles sitting on the top of the snout. Uh, the avocado seed weevil is in the genus Helipus, and those males do not. So you can't just pick up any weevil, look at it, and assume that all the males would have bristles on the nose and the females don't. So that takes a, you've got to know a little bit about the types of weevils that you're working with to be able to identify them like that. Um, I think you may have answered this already. Uh, question is, are we putting a healthy palm at risk by placing a trap near it? Yes. So uh, studies out of Europe suggest that. Um, work that we have now done evaluating the capture efficiency of the Pacusin and the bucket traps strongly indicates that traps do not catch 100% of the weevils that go to them. The bucket trap seems to be particularly poor at retaining weevils that are attracted to it. So that's why we suggested that if you are, are responsible for a, you know, protecting palm trees, you know, maybe you've got a, a park with some beautiful 7,500 year old Canary Island date palms, we would strongly suggest that you don't put traps in that park in case the weevils come in, miss the traps and start attacking those palms, or you put them maybe a quarter to half a mile away. And if you get weevil activity in those traps, that suggests that they're probably close by. You might want to begin a management program for those palms that you're most concerned about. So I've had these discussions with Disneyland and um, one of the things that we came up with was, you know, don't put the traps right in Disneyland, but if you have co-work, you have folks that work there that maybe live, you know, a few miles away from Disneyland, and if they wouldn't mind putting a trap up in their backyard and they get a weevil, then that would suggest there are weevils close to Disneyland, and you may want to think about protecting the palms at Disneyland. So there are ways to do it without having to put up traps right next to the palms of interest and I mentioned earlier that the weevils really don't care where the trap is if it's baited with the pheromone and it's got some really nice smelly fermenting dates going on in there they will fly to it you know it could be hanging in a pine tree sitting behind the dumpster in a parking lot you know they, they will track it they will track it down there are other trees in the area in some of these photos that appear to be dying also. Are the weevils known to attack other types of trees or plants? Yeah, the weevil's really specific to palm trees and it doesn't attack pine trees, bougainvilleas, you know, look at this photo, Brazilian pepper tree, anything like that. It really goes after palm trees. And in California right now, its most preferred palm is the Canary Islands date palm. And we also know that it will attack those uh, Mexican fan palms. That was one of the first records in the Baja Peninsula. And we have evidence now that it will attack the Guadalupe palm based on what we have seen at Balboa Park. And the literature suggests that these weevils will also go after the edible date palm, Phoenix dactylifera. So basically it just eats palm trees, but it probably almost certainly has a preference for what species of palms it likes to eat. 
I think it likes palms with big fat trunks and a huge um, pot of meat that's sitting at the top of the palm tree, you know, big fat juicy apical mirror stem, palm heart at the top of it, and it doesn't seem to like as much palms with skinny trunks and probably not a lot of food at the top of those trunks. But having said that, they really do like coconut palms, which have skinny trunks and not a lot of <laughs> apical mirror stem at the top of it. But we don't have a lot of coconut palms here in California. I don't think I've seen any. Another treatment question. Um, what has a better success rate for treatment, soil drenching or trunk injection? Yeah, that's a great question. And I can't answer that right now. And we are doing those trials now with the same products and the same rates. And we're looking at soil injections and trunk injections. Um, Don Hodel, the um, UC Cooperative Extension uh, palm guy, you know, he, he argued, he's argued strongly at our meetings not to damage the trunks of the trees by doing injections. And then I talked to some of the arborists and they say, oh, they're not that a big a deal because you can inject the trunk and then just put a plug of silicone over it and just keep reusing that injection point. So we hope to have, by the middle of next year, we hope to have some definitive answers on, you know, a soil drench is better, a trunk injection is better, and maybe it makes no difference. Maybe they're both, both as good as each other, but we should have those data by the end of summer next year. Uh, is there a minimum size or age class for the beetles to infest? Yeah, so based just casually, um, you know, doing some casual observations, it looks like these weevils prefer to attack palm trees that are probably, you know, maybe nine, 10 feet in height or taller. And I don't really know why they have that height preference. So if you go into areas where there's pretty heavy palm weevil attack, they'll be taking out the taller palms first and a lot of the smaller ones that are maybe under, you know, eight feet or so don't seem to get a lot of interest. But that may just be because they haven't, um, every, the, you know, the more um, preferable palms are still available and those smaller ones will get attacked once those bigger palms are taken out. And I think one last question for you, uh, Professor, is um, um, are the Beetles, when they're attacking trees, do they tend to first go after trees that are already distressed? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Um, like, for example, the, the palms in the Sweetwater Reserve, where we have observed, you know, incredible mortality, I feel that those palms are under no stress. They have abundant water to, to drink, and they're being heavily attacked. A lot of the uh, palms in urban areas also appear to be fairly well irrigated and I wouldn't think that they are under much water stress either. Um, but maybe other stress factors could make the palms more vulnerable to attack. So work out of South America suggests that palm trees that are subjected to some type of fungal infection, once those palms start dying from the fungal infection, they may be releasing volatiles that the weevils find very attractive and that intensifies weevil attack on palms that are already in a, you know, are already in a bad way. But we've seen no evidence for that so far in Southern California. Just about all the palms that have been taken out by South American palm weevils seem to be doing pretty well. Thank you.